Hello, my AP Euro students, it's Emily Poole, and I'm gonna cover everything you need to know for the AP European History exam. Now you might be thinking, oh my gosh, Emily, that's so much information, how am I supposed to remember it all? Have no fear, because if you follow the link in the description below, you'll be able to get access to a free speed review packet that is an outline of everything I'm talking about. But students, wait, I'm gonna ask you to do what I ask my students to do in class. I just want you to put your pencils down and to sit and listen. There will be times in this video when I ask you to pause the video and review the key terms that I just went over and interact with them in a really specific way. All right, documents downloaded, pencils down. It's AP European history time, let's do this. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Western Europe is cut off from trade and broken into feudal kingdoms. Catholicism becomes the glue that unites people together, and it's the Catholic Church's canon law that provides political stability in a time of otherwise political fragmentation. Now, this time in Europe is sometimes called the Dark Ages because of its loss of literacy and education after the fall of the Roman Empire, but that itself is not even entirely true. I just provided you with relevant information that you need to know to understand how and why the Renaissance started. So what is it that leads to this renaissance, this rebirth in Europe? The Crusades. Now students, what I just did is called contextualization, and that is how you need to start off every essay on your AP History test. What relevant information does the reader need to know so that your essay is situated within the broader historical context of the events of the prompt? Greek and Roman texts that had been preserved in Islamic madrasas and in the Byzantine Empire were brought back to Western Europe by these crusaders. And scholars like Petrarch begin to read these old Greek and Roman classics. This begins a revival of humanist thought in Europe, and Europeans begin shifting their focus from religion and theology towards secularism and individual achievement. This revival of classical learning also allows Europeans to challenge traditionally held sources of power in a ton of ways. And what's their main target? the Catholic Church. New political philosophers like Machiavelli advocate for a secular state and believe that a ruler's primary concern should be the survival of the state, not religion. And with its focus on humanism, art also begins to shift from heavily religious scenes to depicting the beautiful classical Roman form to hearkening back to the glory days of Greece and Rome. And wealthy patrons like the Medici family in Italy begin commissioning beautiful pieces of art in order to glorify and bedazzle their city. And as this new humanist thought travels north throughout Europe, it changes. The Northern Renaissance is characterized more so by Christianity and Christian humanism when compared to the Italian Renaissance. Now, the AP test loves to ask differences between these two, the Northern Renaissance and the Italian Renaissance, and a great way to compare them is by looking at Desiderius Erasmus and Niccolo Machiavelli. Now, similarly, both of them write about how a leader should act. However, Erasmus argues that the main object should not be the extension of his domain, but rather the benefit of it, and that a leader should lead by example and with virtue and with courage and with strong Christian character. Machiavelli says that it is better to be feared than loved and that the ends justify the means. Comparing the two artistic movements is also a great idea. Northern Renaissance focuses more on naturalism, realism, and intense attention to detail versus the classical ideal present in the Italian Renaissance. And by the way, all of this is spreading because of the printing press. It's Gutenberg's invention that facilitates the spread of this knowledge, and it also leads to a rise of the vernacular language, the local language, not Latin. People begin writing all of their ideas down into books and then mass publishing those books, which leads to an increase in knowledge and also literacy and also general learning. And kings continue challenging these traditionally held sources of power, looking at you, the Catholic Church, through the creation of centralized modern states. As the king's powers increase, the pope's political powers decrease. But of course, this doesn't come without conflict. Henry VIII breaks away from the Catholic Church and forms the Anglican Church, and Ferdinand and Isabella unite Spain under the banner of Catholicism and then also expel all of the Jews and Muslims. And now that Europeans are connected back to these trade routes in Asia and in Africa, they gain access to new navigational technologies from those places. Using the astrolabe, latine sails, and the compass, Europeans set sail in order to get more involved in those trade routes. Now say it with me, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue because he wanted to actually get involved in the Indian Ocean trade and he didn't want to go through the Ottoman Empire. So this Italian sets west from Spain, hoping to land somewhere in Asia, but lands in the Caribbean. And this new transatlantic trade route sets up the Columbian Exchange, this transfer of goods, ideas, people, and diseases from Afro-Eurasia to the Americas. Now this has a positive social impact on Europe. 
Nutrient-dense foods from the Americas, like the potato, are brought back to Europe, leading to population increase. The European population rises back to what it was in those pre-Black Plague levels. But the Columbian Exchange also has disastrous social impacts on Africa and the Americas, as it sets up the transatlantic slaving system, in which millions of Africans are taken from their home, shipped along the Middle Passage, and forced to work in sugar and coffee plantations in the Americas. The mercantilist policies behind this triangular trade has raw goods coming from the Americas and finished goods sent back to the colonies. And this influx of raw goods from the Americas leads to the creation of the cottage industry or the putting out industry in Europe. Think of this as an old school assembly line where people make different pieces of a finished product. Uh, the beginnings of industry are starting in Europe. Inspired by gold, glory, and God, European states sponsor expedition to this new world and set up colonies. This scramble for land, money, and resources leads to conflict among European states. Specifically, on the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal agree to the Treaty of Tordesillas, which lets Spain colonize west of the line of demarcation, while Portugal turns toward the Indian Ocean. With this new influx of money coming into Europe, new financial institutions arise, like the Bank of Amsterdam and the Dutch East India Company. And while this is benefiting new economic elites, it's not great for the average European yet, because many of them still rely on subsistence farming. However, lower-class Europeans are still impacted by this because agriculture becomes increasingly commercialized through the enclosure movement. As wealthy Europeans are buying up this farmer's land, it forces many workers to move into the cities to find new jobs. This itself leads to a host of problems like poor sanitation, poverty, and crime. Now, the AP test will definitely talk about the difference in what's happening in the West and what's happening in the East, so let's examine that here. Economic power is shifting from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic as a result of trade, and new economic systems are emerging in these trading states. This leads to a wealthy middle class of merchants emerging in the West. Meanwhile, in the East, serfdom is codified. This is when we start to see an economic difference emerge between the West and the East in Europe. Now, due to an increase in literacy and more access to published material, radical changes start happening in Europe. Martin Luther critiques the Catholic Church in his 95 Theses, and the Protestant Reformation begins. Many other reformers follow in Luther and Calvin's footsteps, and myriad new Protestant denominations are formed. Wars of religion break out in France in the French Wars of Religion and in Central Europe in the Thirty Years' War. Do you remember how I said, like, the Catholic Church was the glue that held people together for a while? Yeah, these new denominations start to pull that apart and challenge the religious unity of once united European Christendom. After decades of fighting, in 1648, diplomacy wins out. The Peace of Westphalia establishes the basis for religious pluralism existing in Europe. Now, the AP test loves a comparison, so let's talk about it. The Edict of Nantes, issued by French King Henri IV after the French Wars of Religion, allows for Huguenots to freely practice their faith outside of the city of Paris, and this is in effect until it's later revoked by King Louis XIV under the Treaty of Fontainebleau. In contrast, the Peace of Westphalia keeps the peace, religiously speaking, in Central Europe for a long time. The Protestant Reformation does also lead to reform in the Catholic Church. In the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church reforms and also devils down on its doctrine when it publishes the Index of Prohibited Books. Also, Jesuits are commissioned to bring people back to the one true faith and are sent as missionaries to Latin America. They were also known for setting up schools. Looking at you, Ignatius of Loyola. Now, the Catholic Church also begins commissioning Baroque art and architecture. Baroque art and architecture is all about emotion and the drama. And it was commissioned by the Catholic Church to showcase heaven on earth, but it was also commissioned by the church and other wealthy people to show off their glory and wealth and status looking again at you, Louis XIV. But the Protestant Reformation has social effects as well. Martin Luther advocates for a priesthood of all believers, so um, does that include women? Can women preach and receive an education now? It turns out no, because a lot of the women who pursued education were then accused of witchcraft. Now, this debate about women has advocates on both sides and continues throughout, like, all of European history. Now that there's so much change in religious authorities, and now that people aren't just united under one common belief, which means they're not united by one common code of conduct, local governments begin regulating morality. Can old communal activities like Carnival and Saints Day festivities exist, or should they not? Now, students, that's the end of period one in AP European history. I just covered everything from 1450 to 1648. So now let's address that speed review packet. Look at your speed review packet, which I organized thematically, by the way, and circle the terms that you still don't feel comfortable with. That way, you'll know what you need to study. 
Now, if you're like, um, Emily, I actually know all of this information already because I've read every single word in my textbook and I study in all of my free time. I'm like genuinely happy for you. That is amazing. What you can do is check the box next to that theme to know that you have that info down and that you don't need to restudy it. All right, let's start period two, which is from 1648 to 1815. European political institutions experienced change due to the Renaissance's focus on humanism and also due to the upheaval caused by the Protestant Reformation. Nobility groups began to challenge the monarch's growing power and influence like we see with the Fronde in France, and minority groups begin to fight for independence against their dominant national group like the Dutch against the Spanish-controlled Netherlands. But the first major revolution to happen during this time period is the English Civil War. In 1215, the Magna Carta established the necessity of the monarch working alongside the parliament, but when James IV of Scotland becomes James I of England after Elizabeth I dies, he challenged that. You see, James desired to rule absolutely, as did his son Charles I. Charles continually goes around Parliament in order to raise money to fund his wars, and Parliament's like, hey Charles, how about we not do that? And Charles is like, um, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Yeah, this is a bad move, and Charles challenges Parliament so much that he ends up forming an army against them, kicking off the English Civil War. Oliver Cromwell and his new model army take down the Royalists, try Charles I for treason, and behead him. Oliver Cromwell declares himself Lord Protector for life, and England is like, yeah, we want Protestant rule, but we don't want, like, Puritan rule. So they ask Charles I's son, Charles II, to come be monarch. At Charles II's death, his son James II comes into power, but he's Catholic and England is like, yeah, we definitely don't want that. So in the Glorious Revolution, England asked James II's daughter, Mary, married to William of Orange from the Netherlands, to rule jointly. Collectively, they signed the English Bill of Rights, which ensures that Parliament must meet regularly and also says that the English monarch must be Protestant. Speaking of William of Orange, the Dutch established their own republic. This wealthy oligarchy of urban elites becomes extraordinarily economically prosperous. And what do wealthy merchants like to do? Commission art. Dutch art reflects a commercialized society as artists like Vermeer paint regular people doing regular activities. But because so many Europeans are reaping in economic benefits from their colonies in the Americas and in Asia, these European countries are still fighting each other. But these conflicts that break out are no longer based on religion, they're based rather on this idea of a balance of power, wanting to make sure that you have a similar amount of power and influence as those that border you. And in order to achieve this balance of power, many European countries, using their wealth from the New World, create stronger standing armies and start to utilize more advanced military technologies. Oh, poor Poland is at the center of this conflict in the East, and it becomes partitioned by its stronger neighbors, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. But all of these wars happening around Europe lead to more taxes because they need to be funded somehow. And we know what those taxes lead to. Revolution. But speaking of Russia, Peter I, or Peter the Great, westernizes Russia. Believing Russia to be far behind its European counterparts, he sets on building St. Petersburg as his window on the West and models the city and the culture of the boyars, the Russian nobility, after Western Europe. He also ushers in a rise of education through his Russian Academy of Sciences so that Russia can be a contender in this European balance of power. Speaking of the Russian Academy of Sciences, the scientific revolution has taken root in Europe in the 17th century. Going off of those classical Greek and Roman texts, scientists start to posit new ideas and new theories. Copernicus proposes and Galileo proves the heliocentric theory, and Vesalius disprove Galen's four humors theory through their study of the circulatory system, and Bacon and Descartes define the inductive and deductive methods of reasoning. But the AP test wants you to know that some of these scientists, like Kepler and Newton, still believe that there are spiritual forces that govern the cosmos. Hey, a notable female scientist is Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who, after her time in the Ottoman Empire, brings inoculation back to Europe. Plague and other major epidemic diseases begin to disappear. As in the mortality decreases, and as the general population increases due to the agricultural revolution, the focus on child rearing increases. Now, whereas scientists in the scientific revolution tried to figure out the laws that govern the natural world, 
Philosophers in the Enlightenment tried to figure out laws that govern human society. John Locke believed that people were born with natural rights, life, liberty, and property, and he believed that it was the duty of the government to protect those rights. And Locke advocated for revolution against a government that didn't protect those rights. Hobbes supports absolutism because he believes that in the state of nature, life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Meanwhile, Montesquieu believes that absolute power could lead to corruption, so he advocates for a separation of powers. Voltaire, more like Volhaire, am I right, believed in freedom of speech and the right to critique the church and the government because he was jailed many times for doing so. Voltaire is a pen name, after all. Rousseau believes that powerful institutions corrupt and advocated for exploratory childhood education. Yet he also believed that women should be excluded from education and political life, which made Mary Wollstonecraft go, Roos, no. Wollstonecraft argued that women only appear inferior to men because they lack equal access to education. Now, women also had a unique role in the Enlightenment in that they were the hosts of the salons, places in which these philosophers came to discuss their theories. These Enlightenment philosophers are not only discussing their ideas in salons and coffee houses, they're writing everything down and publishing it in newspapers and pamphlets. And Denis Diderot compiles all of this learning and knowledge and information together in his first encyclopedia. Europe is becoming an incredible increasingly learned society. Economically, mercantilist policies were challenged by physiocrats and by famous economist Adam Smith, who favored free trade and open markets. Now, the church says that truth comes from God, and the Enlightenment says that truth comes from reason. This means that new religious views like deism, God as a clockmaker, and atheism are on the rise. But even with that, the Enlightenment does correspond with a rise in religious toleration across Europe. But where do these enlightened political ideals take root? because it's not in Western Europe. Heck no, Louis XIV is not going to give up the wealth and glory of Versailles to make some third estate pleb happy. Rather, these philosophies are embraced by absolute monarchs in the East. Monarchs like Joseph II of Austria and Frederick II of Prussia still rule absolutely, but as enlightened absolute rulers, as they begin to allow religious toleration and more access to education within their states. Now, these enlightened absolute monarchs are not without their conflict. Frederick II fights against the Austrian Habsburgs in the Seven Years' War. Britain and France get involved, which means their colonies do too, and this plays out as the French and Indian War and North America. Because Britain and Prussia win, Britain supplants France as the dominant European power. And because this was a massive war, Britain had to raise taxes. And what does that lead to? The American Revolution. Motivated by the American Revolution, the French people likewise fight against their monarchy. Suffering under famine and taxes and inspired by Enlightenment ideals, the Third Estate draft their Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen and successfully fight for a constitutional monarchy. Yeah, but then things get radical with another regicide, the beheading of King Louis XVI, and the reign of terror begins. Jean Paul Marat foments political turmoil through his newspaper, which is a great example of mass media calling public to action. Robespierre's reign of terror leads to the deaths of thousands and ushers in mass chaos, not only in France, but also in European countries watching what's happening in France. Critics like Burke begin to stress the importance of adhering to traditional conservative values after this. But supporters of the revolution, like those in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, follow in that rallying cry of liberty, equality, and brotherhood, and fight for independence against France, which they successfully gain in 1804. With the end of the monarchy and after the reign of terror, a five-man directory steps in to keep the peace. But this definitely doesn't last long, because Napoleon throws his coup d'etat and seizes power for himself. Napoleon upholds some values of the revolution, like education and the creation of a meritocracy, but absolutely curtails others, looking at you, women's rights. Napoleon rules his first consul and then begins his conquest of continental Europe. His expansion ushers in some benefits in Europe, like the creation of civil codes and lands that he conquers, and it also does lead to the rise of nationalism in these places. After Napoleon is exiled a second time to St. Helena, European leaders get together to try to restore this balance of power. Led by Metternich, this Congress of Vienna restores the Bourbon monarchy and strengthens countries that border France so that you know, 
no one can ever conquer like Napoleon just did. Students, we have just finished period two. We just covered everything you need to know from 1648 to 1815. So it's time to grab out that speed review packet, pause the video, circle the terms that you don't know, and check off the ones that you do. Britain was able to withstand Napoleon's advances partly because of the fact that it had gone through its industrial revolution. Thanks to iron and coal deposits, natural waterways, a supportive government, and its wealth from its colonies, Britain is able to industrialize, starting with the textile industry. Now, industrialization does start in Britain, but industrialism spreads throughout continental Europe, but lags in the east due to a lack of resources and a persistence of serfdom. New technologies like the Bessemer process, electricity, and chemicals emerge in the second wave of industrialization and are able to be quickly transferred across Europe due to new transportational technologies like the railroad and steamships. And in 1851, Britain showcases its glory to the world at its great exhibition, a World's Fair, which highlighted its industrial supremacy. Industrialism is great and progress is good, right? Well, not at first. Industrialization led to massive problems, long working hours, low wages, and rampant health issues. However, eventually, reformers step in to modernize infrastructure, create public transportation systems, pass public health measures, and promote compulsory education systems for children. Governments passed legislation like the Factory Act of 1833, and workers joined together to form labor unions to address some of these working problems. These, combined with the establishment of political parties that represent workers, allow the average person to eventually have a disposable income and also more free time, which itself leads to a rise in leisure activities and a rise in consumerism. Now, life is getting a little bit better for the factory workers, but life is excellent if you are a factory owner. The social pyramid created as a result of industrialization has factory owners at the top, managers, shopkeepers, engineers, store owners as the middle class, and the working class all the way at the bottom. And this new social and economic pyramid that is created leads to a slew of new political and intellectual developments. And y'all, the AP test loves asking questions about the Industrial Revolution and its political and social effects. Liberals like John Stuart Mill fight for individual rights and believe that governments should intervene in the social and economic problems that resulted from industrialization. Radicals like the Chartists fight for universal male suffrage, and feminists like Emmeline Pankhurst say, um, yeah, we should be included in that too. Socialists believe that in order to bring about social and economic equality, the resources within society need to be redistributed to all. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels argue that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle and their communist manifesto. Lastly, anarchists are like, government is unnecessary. Art, of course, reflects these social upheavals, as it always does, and the Romantic movement emerges. Romanticism emerges as a response to the Enlightenment's focus on rationalism and reason, and also as a response to industrialization due to its effects on the environment. Romantic art Artists like Friedrich focus on landscapes and nature, and writers like Victor Hugo focus on emotion and individuality. Realism also emerges, and writers like Emile Zola utilize their craft to address social problems, in this case, anti-Semitism. And while industrialization causes social and political upheaval in Europe, it also causes political revolutions. Due to economic hardship and discontent with the political system in Europe, a series of revolutions break out in 1848. Some, like the Decemberist Revolt, fight against persisting serfdom and monarchy, while others, like the Greeks and the Ottoman Empire, fight for political independence. And it's these revolutions and the continuing increase in nationalism that paved the way for the breakdown of the concert of Europe. Because Prussia was the first to industrialize among the German states, Prussia becomes the leader of an increasingly unified Germany. And it's Bismarck who utilizes realpolitik and industrialized warfare to officially unify Germany. Similarly, Garibaldi's strong military and Cavour's diplomacy lead to a unified Italy. Austria-Hungary becomes united under a dual monarchy in order to promote political stability in its nation with many different ethnic groups. And Jewish nationalism, called Zionism, develops under Theodor Herzl as a response to growing anti-Semitism in Europe. But German and Italian unification were only able to happen due to the Crimean War. It's also as a response to this war that Alfred Lord Tennyson writes The Charge of the Light Brigade, which is a praise of nationalism as it highlights duty to country no matter the inevitable outcome. After the war, the Ottoman Empire begins to face more conflict as the Balkan nations push for political independence. And after its loss in the Crimean War, Russian leader Tsar 
Tsar Alexander II pushes for modernization and reform as he realizes that Russia has fallen behind Europe militarily and economically. Now, another factor contributing to the growth of nationalism is Charles Darwin's theory on evolution, which Herbert Spencer took and applied to human society in what became known as social Darwinism. This is the theory of evolution as it pertains to human societies, that the societies that are the fittest are the ones that have ascended to the top which begins to justify racial theories reflected in Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden. And these new racial theories, coupled with Europeans' sense of superiority, pave the way for imperialism. Using superior industrialized warfare and weaponry and newly developed medicine, European countries colonize Africa and Asia. At the Berlin Conference in 1884, King Leopold II of Belgium hosts a gathering of European states in which they look at a map of Africa and mainly through diplomatic means agree to its partition. Now, just a reminder that these European leaders neglected the fact that there were thousands of different ethnic groups and language groups and also powerful kingdoms existing in Africa at the time. And this arbitrary division of drawing borders around desired resources has led to enduring conflicts. Many colonized lands fight against their colonies colonizers and against outside European influence like the Sepoy Rebellion in India and the Boxer Rebellion in China. The late 1800s in Europe is marked by an increasing emphasis on irrationality, and this new relativism leads to a loss of confidence in the objectivity of knowledge. And this age of anxiety continues through new developments in science, like Einstein's theory of relativity. This leads to modern art, as artists begin to shift from the representational to the subjective and abstract. Okay, students, you know what time it is. That's the end of period three. That is 1815 to 1914. So you need to pause this video, grab out that speed review sheet, check off the things that you do know, circle the things that you don't know. We're almost done. By the early 1900s, tensions among European states were at an all-time high. The buildup of military, the conflict that resulted from imperialism, rising nationalism, and a complex system of alliances all came to a head when Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. European countries got dragged into this war due to that entangling web of alliances, and industrialized warfare made this conflict extraordinarily deadly. As people cannot defend themselves against enemy machine guns, fighting went underground into the trenches, and and this led to even more new technological developments, like poison gas and tanks. World War I leads to such death and destruction that the Central Powers and the Allied Powers come together and agree to a ceasefire, an armistice, in 1918. The military stalemate in World War I, coupled with Tsar Nicholas II's bad political decisions, exacerbate problems in Russia. Russia officially leaves World War I with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, and it's under Lenin and his Bolsheviks that the Russian Revolution begins. These Russians want peace, land and bread, and the Bolshevik-led Russian Revolution occurs, removing the monarchy. And after a civil war, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is officially established in 1922. In order to prevent future war, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson proposes a League of Nations, which ultimately fails because the U.S., Germany, and the Soviet Union do not participate. However, this League of Nations does divide up forward German and Ottoman-controlled land in the mandate system, and you can think of this like a Berlin Conference 2.0. The Treaty of Versailles places much of the blame for World War I on Germany and forces Germany to pay billions of dollars in reparations. This is not economically great for Germany, and this is further exacerbated when the U.S. stock market crashes in 1929. In this ensuing global economic crisis, extremist movements arise. Fascist dictatorships in Germany and Italy appeal to the disgruntled oppressed classes by glorifying nationalism and rejecting democracy through intentional propaganda machines. In Spain, nationalist leader Franco allies with Hitler and Mussolini in the Spanish Civil War. This conflict becomes a testing ground to see if Western democratic countries would intervene. And spoiler alert, they don't. Western powers like Britain and France instead adopt a policy of appeasement, which allows for more aggression by Hitler and Mussolini. Hitler remilitarizes, annexes land around Germany, and signs a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union in order to not fight a two-front war, just in case something were to happen. Now, authoritarian leaders do rise in the East, especially under Joseph Stalin. Stalin attempts to modernize the USSR's economy through the collectivization of agriculture and his five-year plans, both of which were disastrous for citizens. In 1933, Hitler establishes the first concentration camp at Dachau. With the passing of the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, the Nazis signify that they are trying to create a new racial order in Europe. Their main target is the Jews, but the Nazis also target Roma, homosexuals, people with disabilities, and anyone who speaks out against the Nazi party in the Holocaust. 
In 1939, World War II starts in Europe when Hitler invades Poland, and Germany's blitzkrieg military tactics prove extremely successful. With U.S. and Soviet involvement, Allied powers are able to end the war in the European theater in May of 1945. And after dropping two atomic bombs, the war in the Pacific ends in August of 1945. Decades of conflict in Europe resulted in a lost generation, a generation increasingly marked by cynicism and disillusionment. However, it did also lead to the transformation of women's roles in society as women were actively involved in both war efforts. Through the efforts of feminists like Simone de Beauvoir, women began achieving more economic, political, and social rights, and even began attaining higher levels of political office. Reproductive movements like the creation of the birth control pill allowed women to experience more freedom in their personal and professional lives. Now, but as soon as World War II ends, the Cold War begins. The Cold War is an ideological battle between the West and the East, between capitalism and democracy and totalitarianism totalitarianism and communism. The U.S., now a global superpower, finances the rebuilding of Europe through its Marshall Plan. In line with their policy of containment, the U.S. also provides military assistance to countries resisting the spread of communism through the Truman Doctrine. Politically, the West unites under NATO, and countries east of the Iron Curtain unite under the Warsaw Pact. These alliances are intended to link these countries together politically, but also economically, as we see with Comic-Con in the East and GATT in the West. Soviet leader Khrushchev attempts to distance himself himself from Stalin's atrocities through de-Stalinization, but the Eastern Bloc still experienced restrictions of rights and freedoms, suppression of dissent, and constraint of migration. It was finally under Gorbachev's two policies of glasnost and perestroika, openness of the press and economic restructuring, that former Soviet satellite states were able to fight for independence. The USSR falls in 1991, which leads to massive political restructuring in Europe. The Czechs and Slovaks part, Yugoslavia dissolves, and many former satellite states petition to join the EU. Western European countries increasingly adopt interventionist social welfare policies after World War II in order to alleviate economic burdens faced by the citizens. But as time progresses, these cradle-to-grave social welfare programs were met with increasing criticism. Nationalism continues to rise as groups fight for independence or more rights, both within the former Soviet bloc, like the Bosnian Genocide, and in the West, like the IRA in Ireland. And outside of Europe, former colonies fight for independence against their colonizers in a movement known as decolonization. This process sometimes happens peacefully and through non-violent methods like what we see in India, but sometimes it's met with a lot of violence like what we see in Algeria. And people from these former European colonies in Africa and in Asia migrate to Europe, which itself is met with many problems. This subsequent change in the ethnic and religious makeup of Europe is met with a wave of anti-immigration policies and sentiments in the late 1900s. The the Catholic Church reformed the Second Vatican Council, and many Christian leaders like Bonhoeffer spoke out against totalitarianism. Similarly to what was happening in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s, social groups in Europe also fight for civil rights and political rights. And in order to prevent future war and keep the peace, European countries become more politically and economically integrated over time. Alliances like the European Coal and Steel Community and the Common Market eventually pave the way for the European Union. And new political parties like Green Parties challenge the rise of consumerism that emerges in Europe after World War II. They also urge sustainable development and war against increasing globalization. And the EU today continues to face a host of problems regarding political sovereignty. I mean, Brexit. But also, there are increasing conflicts over immigration and national identity. Um, students, we just did it! We covered the entirety of the AP European History course from 1450 to the present! For the last time, grab out that speed review packet, circle the things you don't know, check off the things that you do know, go study and go get a five on that AP test. As I always tell my students, you can do it, I believe in you.